tonight. I've been truthful and consistent on every single level. Mr. Smollett is still saying that he is innocent. How dare him? Accused of staging a hate crime, all charges are dropped against actor Jesse Smollett. Why the Chicago police and the mayor, though, aren't dropping anything. It should have been in there. CBC News has the flight handbook for that grounded Boeing plane. What's missing from the main manual is causing serious concerns. It was shocking when I added it up this morning, kind of sickening. And we go in depth on diabetes, from the soaring cost of having type one to the potential of completely reversing type two. This is The National. One prime minister, two battlefronts. For weeks, Justin Trudeau's government has faced a barrage of accusations of corruption and political interference. And since December, the arrest of a powerful Huawei executive earned Canada the wrath of a global superpower. It is that relationship today that took another hit. China has blocked canola imports from a second Canadian company, Viterra. Beijing says the product is tainted, the prime minister seem to suggest otherwise. We know that the canola produced here in Canada is top quality and the uh, oversight, inspection and science that surrounds uh, what we do here is uh, top notch and world class. It all adds up to a big problem. China bought more than two and a half billion dollars worth of Canadian canola last year. So as the CBC's Cameron McIntosh tells us, farmers here have reason to be anxious for the growing season ahead. Farmer Charles Fossey takes pride in canola. 85% of global supply comes from Canadian farms, like his. This is maybe four or five hundred bushels. Right now, he's cautiously watching as China shuts out Canadian imports, driving down prices. A quarter of his crop will be canola this year. He's already committed to the seed. So far, our plans haven't changed. We're still going to be growing canola. Still can't help but feel a little nervous. Almost 40% of Canada's canola exports go to China. At this point, it's really in the hands of uh, government uh, dealing with China. China says biological pests have been found in recent shipments from Regina-based Viterra. A similar ban was imposed on Winnipeg's Richardson International earlier this month. Both companies deny contamination. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency hasn't been able to confirm China's claims. So far, there has been no evidence produced. If there's no evidence, let's move on. If there is, let's see it. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister met privately with the head of Richardson International in Winnipeg today. Trudeau said he's considering names for a high-level delegation to China, including Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland. Her father is a canola farmer. This isn't the first time canola has been at the heart of a trade dispute with China, but this does seem to be the most complicated. Our concern is that there uh, appears to be, you know, a lot of these issues coming. There appear to be new issues from, you know, coming from China from day to day. And um, so we're puzzled as to how to solve this. Meanwhile, fields are thawing to get a crop in. Fossey has to start seeding by early May. There's time for diplomacy. I certainly hope so. So while most producers are waiting on diplomacy to run its course, all they can really do is watch the thaw, plant their crops, and then hope that there's a resolution by harvest. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, near Starbuck, Manitoba. Now, while the Prime Minister didn't directly connect the Chinese trade dispute with the tense political context, he did concede this. Obviously, we have seen uh, a certain amount of challenges in our relationships with China uh, over, uh, uh, over sort of diplomatic uh, issues and indeed the rule of law. Ottawa's relationship with Beijing certainly has changed since the arrest in December of Meng Wanzhou, the CFO of global Chinese tech giant Huawei. That happened in Vancouver at the request of the U.S., where she now faces financial fraud charges. China has since detained two Canadians, alleging espionage and canola, just the latest casualty in an ongoing battle. Then there's that other fight, the one that's consumed Ottawa for weeks. The Liberals did manage to prevent new hearings on the SNC-Lavalin affair today, but one of their own, MP Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, is not exactly towing the party line. David Cochran explores what that could mean going forward. The issue has moved to a different committee. 
Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics. With some different faces, but essentially the same arguments. I believe Canadians deserve to hear the full truth. The Liberals are using their power to silence the former Attorney General and the former President of the Treasury Board. Uh, either put up or cover up. And essentially the same result. So we're going to the vote. Okay, Mr. Erskine-Smith. No. The Liberals same. voted against opening hearings at the Ethics Committee, not, they say, because they oppose it. Rather, they argue it is premature. Jody Wilson-Raybould is poised to send additional written testimony to the Justice Committee, which is the only committee covered by her waiver of cabinet confidentiality and solicitor client privilege. Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott both say they won't violate their oaths of secrecy, so there's little point in asking them to testify here. They're not going to be able to say anything to our committee uh, be because of the oaths that they've made and because the waiver doesn't apply. If the Prime Minister gives that permission, all of these debates go away. But the Prime Minister hasn't given that permission and has given every indication he won't. Which brings this to a standoff. Trudeau won't budge while his former ministers say they can't speak freely, but suggest they have much more to tell. This is seven weeks of torture for Liberals. Every single day, the story changes and becomes worse. For days now, a stream of Liberal MPs have argued that Phil Pot and Wilson-Raybould can use parliamentary privilege to override their oaths of secrecy and tell their story. I don't think uh, we are, as Liberals, united on this front. But Erskine Smith says they shouldn't be forced to take such extreme measures. If Wilson-Raybould's written testimony leaves unanswered questions, he says the Prime Minister should budge then yes, I think to get at the truth, there should be, there should be a broadening of, of that waiver. That's one Liberal's view. The others on the committee either disagree or left without answering the question. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And one last note. Last night we told you about leaked reports claiming Trudeau and Wilson Raybould had, Raybould had clashed before, specifically that he had questioned her judgment over recommending a conservative Manitoba judge for the Supreme Court two years ago. Well, today, if you were expecting Trudeau to shed more light on the matter, tough luck. The uh, choice of uh, Supreme Court justices and uh, indeed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of, of Canada uh, is always a decision by the Prime Minister. Um, Canadians can know that they, have, they can have confidence in uh, our institutions, in our judicial system. Uh, and I have uh, no further comment to make on this particular uh, uh, story. But today, the Canadian Bar Association did have something to say about how messy this has become. There is a process to get informed input about the merits of the applicants. It rightly goes on behind closed doors. Breaching confidentiality demeans the selection process and all those who hold the office of judge. And Ian, now to another strange legal odyssey. The hate crime case involving Jesse Smollett down south. It took a stunning twist today. That's right, Andrew. The Empire actor had been accused and charged with staging an attack against himself. But now all 16 charges against him have been dropped, his record wiped clean, a decision that has infuriated both Chicago's police chief and mayor. If you're in a position of influence and power, you'll get treated one way, other people will be treated another way. There is no accountability then in the system. It is wrong, full stop. A strong allegation and one the state's attorney's office denies. Ellen Morrow has more on why the charges were dropped and what it means for Smollett. A celebratory selfie marking a stunning reversal of fortune. The case against Jesse Smollett, over. I would not be my mother's son if I was capable of one drop of what I have been accused of. Gone are the 16 charges Smollett was facing for allegedly faking a hate crime. The actor said two supporters of President Trump attacked him, yelling racial and homophobic slurs. Chicago police said Smollett made it all up for publicity. Now they're angry the case has been dropped. Do I think justice will serve? No. Despite again proclaiming his innocence, Smollett has not been exonerated, nor was he actually the victim of a hate crime, says the lawyer who made the call to drop the charges. Instead, he explained the decision like this. He did community service. He forfeited his bond. Had he not done either and both of those two things, we would not have gotten to the outcome that we got to today. This is a whitewash of justice. 
Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel blasted the move, saying Smollett was let off because of his celebrity status. This is a person now who's been let off scot-free with no sense of accountability of the moral and ethical wrong of his actions. Smollett's alleged attack dominated headlines for weeks. President Trump weighed in. 2020 contender Kamala Harris called it an attempted modern-day lynching. Then Smollett's claims unraveled. Now the actor hopes for redemption, even though authorities maintain his guilt. Now I'd like nothing more than to just get back to work and move on with my life. The public will have to move on without any real answers. Not only have the charges been dropped, all the court documents have been sealed. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. This week, we're expecting the release of the preliminary report into the crash of that Ethiopian Airlines flight just over two weeks ago. In the meantime, the airline CEO says the pilots were trained on, quote, all appropriate simulators for the Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet, pushing back against earlier reports to the contrary. Pilot training on those planes has been under scrutiny after allegations that crews weren't initially told about new anti-stall software. Reports suggest a link between that system and two deadly crashes, the one in Ethiopia and before that in Indonesia. Well, now CBC News has obtained a copy of the 737 MAX 8 flight manual. As Frederick Zalak explains, what's not in it raises troubling questions. Shortly after taking off from Jakarta last October, a Lion Air Boeing 737 MAX started to behave erratically. Pilots flipped through their manual, trying to figure out how to regain control, but the manual would be of little help. The brand new airplane crashed, killing all 189 passengers and crew. Investigators suspect a new software called MCAS may have contributed to the tragedy. This system is designed to force the plane to pitch down if it thinks the aircraft is about to stall. But in the Lion Air case, a faulty sensor gave the wrong signal, prompting the MCAS system to kick in repeatedly, countering the pilot's efforts to bring the nose back up. CBC News has obtained a copy of the flight crew manual of the 737 MAX. And what's shocking many in the industry is what's not in it. There's not a single mention of it in the body of the manual, leaving some pilots fuming. I'm left to wonder, what else don't I know? The flight manual is inadequate and almost criminally insufficient, wrote one pilot in a report filed to a U.S. government safety database. It, it should have been in there because the system is critical to the safety of the flight. Retired pilot Raymond Hall flew for Air Canada for 36 years and is now practicing aviation law in Vancouver. The pilots ought to have known that it was there, ought to have been able to recognize when it's implemented, and ought to have been able to respond effectively. We did find exactly one mention of MCAS in the manual, in the glossary of abbreviations. Why would an acronym be in the glossary without appearing anywhere else? We asked Boeing, but got no answer. Well, I think the fairly obvious conclusion is that a broader explanation of MCAS was included in an earlier edition of the manual, and somewhere along the way, it ended up on the cutting room floor. Aviation consultant Judson Rollins says Boeing, facing stiff competition from Airbus, may have been looking to reduce training costs for airlines switching from its old 737 model. I think the most likely reason for the MCAS not being mentioned in the manual is to remove it for, or prevent it from having to be included in 737 MAX transition training, which in turn will save 737 MAX operators uh, training costs. In an emailed response to CBC News, Boeing didn't deny that there were no references to MCAS in the body of the manual. But a spokesman said that the relevant functions of the system were described in the manual in that media reports that we intentionally withheld information about airplane functionality from our customers are simply untrue. Boeing is now facing a criminal investigation in the U.S. Investigators have reportedly requested information from Boeing about safety procedures, including what's in those manuals. Frédéric Zalak, CBC News, Vancouver. As the investigation into the crash of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 continues, today the airline CEO pledged support for Boeing, saying, let me be clear, Ethiopian Airlines believes in Boeing. They've been a partner of ours for many years, 
Despite the tragedy, Boeing and Ethiopian Airlines will continue to be linked well into the future. We're watching a developing story in the GTA tonight. There are reports an international student from China has been found, though his condition is not confirmed. Wang Zhen Lu was kidnapped by three masked men in the parking garage of his condo building on Saturday. The 22-year-old was shocked multiple times with a stun gun and forced into an van. An arrest was made earlier today of a 35-year-old Toronto man. Police say they still don't know the motive, but we are expecting an update from police within the next hour, and we'll have the latest on that for you on CBC News Network. And this is an opportunity, this is a moment when we can take our own direction, when we can be a beacon to the rest of the world. And with that announcement, Prince Edward Islanders learned they'd be going to the polls April 23rd. This will be the first election since new districts were set. The vote will also include a referendum on electoral reform to decide whether to switch to proportional representation. And still ahead on The National, a disease that affects millions of Canadians with a cost that's hard to stomach. We put diabetes under the microscope. But first, taking the temperature of the economy with a little help from chuck wagons. We'll explain. It gives you a, a real good um, perspective across all the industries, not oil and gas, it's all of them. Construction, uh, financial institutes, everybody. Predicting the future of markets can earn companies billions of dollars, but even the experts are just making educated guesses based on market signals. And you can find them in some unusual places. Tonight, you'll get a look at two of those signals, one from the hard-charging world of the Calgary Stampede, the other flashing on trading desks across the globe. Right now, our people are watching an indicator infamous for predicting recessions, but as Peter Armstrong explains, even ominous signs can be good for some of us. Mortgage rates, for example, are already dropping. For much of the last decade, homeowners and home buyers have been warned interest rates are going up. Well, it seems no one consulted the bond market. Consider how your mortgage rate is set. A bank borrows money on the bond market so it can loan it to you. So as bonds fall, the cost of a typical fixed rate mortgage falls too. Good news. But the bad news is the bond market is being pushed down by deep concerns around the world. China's GDP is slowing. The U.S. economy grew at just 1.5% last quarter. Canada's economy actually shrank at the end of last year. So you're paying less to finance that house or condo because the bond market believes the global economy may be about to get worse, not better. It can mean a lower payment for households, uh, but we also want to see the Canadian economy doing as, as well as possible. The bond market is far larger and far more powerful than the stock market. And right now, it's behaving in a way that's setting off alarm bells. If you loan on the short term, three months, say, that usually yields less reward than a longer loan of, say, 10 years. That's the so-called yield curve. And last week, it flipped. An inverted yield curve has long been seen as a harbinger of a recession. The last time that happened was 2007. Months later, the world plunged into the depths of the financial crisis. The signal, especially in the U.S., has been very reliable. The yield curve slowing down is a clear signal that the economy is slowing down. So where does that leave us? The bond market saying the economy will slow, wages won't rise, and just maybe a global recession is looming, but at least your mortgage payment won't go up, right? Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. In Alberta, a more unorthodox economic signal, the annual canvas sale. Here, business people bid on advertising real estate you just don't see anywhere else. The side of a chuck wagon. The Calgary Stampede's chuck wagon race is known locally as the half mile of hell. It gets attention. And getting your business's name pulled behind the rolling thunder of a rushing team of thoroughbreds? Well, that doesn't come cheap. As Aaron Collins tells us, how much a bidder is willing to pay is seen as a barometer of the province's economy. And with the election campaign underway in that province, it could be a political indicator as well. Around these parts, there can only be one top dog. Hi. I'm Kent Storman with Versatile Energy. 
And for now, at least, that's Kent. And then here are your drink tickets for... That's all? <laughs> the picture of an Albertan on a mission. It's Kurt Metzler, versatile energy. The goal to get his company's name on the fastest chuck wagon again. Last year, that cost $130,000, less than half the record $300,000 paid in 2012 when oil prices were much higher. It gives you a, a real good um, perspective across all the industries, not oil and gas, it's all of them, construction, financial institutes, everybody. Even before the bidding starts, Kent finds his man, two-time defending champ Kurt Benzmiller, but he won't come cheap. I hope that there's a little bit more positivity this year than there was last. So. You bring a big bag of money? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, a splash of liquid courage, a tap of the boots, and with the talking done, it's time to walk the walk. So this is where the rubber hits the road, really? Yeah. Do you have a do you have a limit? Do you have a do you know? Uh, ballpark. Yeah. Yeah, ballpark where I'm gonna go. You're not sharing it. No, I don't know. I don't know what I I, I want to see what our competition is. First on the auction block, the champ. Two hundred. Holy. And with the slightest of nods, it's over. Thank you, sir. What's your number? 137. Final price, $120,000. That's a the bargain, then. A little less than last year, so... Yeah. With a few more dollars in his jeans, it's off to claim his prize. The auction pulls in about the same as last year, stalled like the province's economy. And if the polls are to be believed, waiting for a new government to kickstart it. Yeah, the better the economy is, or the oil is, then the, the better we we get supported, you know, throughout the season. So, from your standpoint, do you think change is a good thing as far as? I, I think change is a good thing because right now it doesn't matter if it's provincial or federal government. I think that we're just in a just in a bad place. The hope is that another win is in the cards for this team, and that Alberta will soon be charging hard again too. It is the Duke of Newberry, wire to wire with his wheels on fire, Kurt Benzmiller. Albertans head to the polls on April 16th. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Well, ahead on the national, our health panel is here. We'll break down the immense cost of diabetes, the human cost, and the financial cost. It was shocking when I added it up this morning, kind of sickening because, you know, between 800, let's say 860 as a conservative figure, that's a mortgage payment in New Glasgow. According to the Canadian Diabetes Association, an estimated 11 million Canadians live with diabetes or are at serious risk of developing it. And on average, every three minutes, another person is diagnosed. The vast majority have what's called type 2, where their bodies can't make use of the insulin in their bodies effectively to control their blood sugars. Type 1 is less common. It's caused when the body's immune system attacks the pancreas, which produces insulin to begin with. Tonight, we're looking at the steep costs of both to patients' wallets on one hand and their well-being on the other. Our health panel, as you can see, we're going to dive into this conversation in just a moment. But first, Vicodopia reveals the staggering costs for some just to stay alive. It's one of the gadgets that keeps Courtney McLaren out of danger. A small pod under her shirt delivers the right amount of insulin, which her body doesn't produce on its own. You're coming down. For type 1 diabetics like Courtney, regularly monitoring blood sugars ensures she doesn't get too much or too little insulin, which could have fatal consequences. But insulin, insulin delivery devices, glucose monitors, test strips, and all the connected supplies add up each month. It was shocking when I added it up this morning, kind of sickening because, you know, between 800, let's say 860 as a conservative figure, that's a mortgage payment in New Glasgow or that's a couple car payments. Provincial insurance coverage has its limits and it's often different for each province. Same with private insurance. Insulin pumps alone can cost as much as $9,000, leaving some people to ration or raise money. There's something very, very wrong when you actually have to go out and fundraise for one of these amazing devices to manage blood sugar. 
thus not being uh, such a drain on the health care system. Those were the days. When Paul Levine was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, most people didn't live past their 60s. Levine is 72, healthy, and a mentor to newly diagnosed young people. A lot of them, uh, you know, don't have uh, jobs where there is insurance coverage, and, uh, and they see it as a, as a real burden. Add to that the worry about rising prices. In the last four years in the U.S., the cost of insulin has doubled. And even with the promise of Pharmacare, diabetic devices and supplies still won't be covered. To leave people to private markets and health care is a, is a difficult thing to do because they really have no control and no ability to control uh, the prices. For now, Tammy McLaren says her family is managing the cost of Courtney's diabetes, but unless the system changes, her daughter will one day have to manage on her own. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. So for people with type 1 diabetes, there can be a steep cost, right, in a few ways. But turning to type 2 diabetes, there's also a steep cost to society there, especially when you consider the fact that many cases of type 2, millions of them, may be preventable. Now, the number of Canadians living with type 2 expected to almost double over a 10-year period. And that rise has a strong link with the rise in obesity, sugar intake, and the fact that we just aren't getting enough exercise. But on the extent to which we can stem the tide of type 2 diabetes and even potentially reverse it, our health panel. Dr. Danielle Martin joining us, uh, Vice President of the Women's College Hospital. Uh, Dr. Lennox Huang joining us as well, Chief Medical Officer at the Hospital for Sick Children. And Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Systems and the University Health Network. Thank you to all of you uh, for Thank being you. here. So there's a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. And I, and I want to start, Danielle, maybe with you, with the concept of pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the Canadian Diabetes Association, millions of Canadians potentially have it. What is it? Well, I think it's important for us to start out by saying pre-diabetes is not a disease. It's a pre-disease, and so it's important um, in, in many cases to identify it, uh, but in and of itself, we, we don't believe that there are complications from living with pre-diabetes. It refers to what? It refers to a rise in the blood sugar that happens as the body's ability to manage the sugar in the blood effectively and pull it out of the bloodstream and store it in the body's tissues, which is a process that, that is governed by insulin, begins to break down. And if it goes too far, if that, that breakdown goes too far, then you end up with actual diabetes, which is an actual disease. And, and the concern there, as you say, is that it, that it may be a precursor specifically to type 2 diabetes. So, so we'll make that, that delineation clear. So, so Lennox, can you walk us through what that means for kids? Uh, so, so for kids, um, really what it is is it sets you up on a different life course. And that's really important because some of what you're going to hear about in terms of the complications of diabetes in adults are made all that much more worse by having type 2 diabetes as a child. And children we know also are much more prone to uh, early complications, and in particular the kidneys. So up to 50% of children with type 2 diabetes have some serious uh, kidney problems and at its very worst could lead to the point of kidney failure and potentially needing uh, dialysis or transplant. And Samir, at the other end of the spectrum, you work predominantly with seniors. Yeah. Uh, there can be complications. There. Yeah, because I think the key is diabetes is one of these conditions that we can live with for many years. And the reason we want to have early diagnosis and effective management, which could be a combination of the things we talked about, is that we can stem the damage that that excess sugar in our bloodstream can cause over time. So think about having clean pipes that then get clogged over time, you know, and, and hardened. And therefore you see these what we call macro and microvascular complications. Macro being your heart, your kidneys, um, your brain getting negatively affected with strokes and other things. Um, and those smaller things like your eyes, um, or even your fingertips losing sensation or even losing vision because those get affected. So I see a lot of those complications in my older patients because they lived a lifetime with diabetes. Right. But we know that those who catch it early and try and manage it as best as possible can sometimes avoid many of those complications and live a relatively healthy life. Is it fair to say type 2 diabetes is preventable? For many people, that is that is a fair thing. But you know, uh, there are, for all of us, there are some things that we can't change about ourselves. We can't change our genetics. So we know, for example, that some populations in Canada, particularly Indigenous populations, 
people uh, from South Asian descent are at, at much higher risk uh, than the general population. We can't change our age and we can't change our gender. A lot of uh, other things that many of us can't change are some of the social and economic drivers right. um, of these illnesses. But um, for the average person, if we take the, you know, if we do our very best, we can often, and if we as a society do our very best, we can often prevent the development of type 2 diabetes. Right, because, because there is this sort of complex interplay between diet, uh, exercise, obesity, yeah. and diabetes. Absolutely. And, and you know, what we say is that, that the course of diabetes is certainly modifiable by lifestyle and environmental factors. And we see, we see in the, the pediatric and the youth population, the rise in type 2 diabetes has directly been correlated with the rise in obesity. So we know if we can target some of the factors that lead to obesity, that we're likely to shift uh, the, the, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. I think the key is that even for older adults who are living you know, with diabetes, you know, if, you, if you have the luxury of having more time on your hands, then adhering to exercise and other things a little bit more if you can means that you can actually better manage your diabetes. And in these cases where they talk about reversing almost, you know, what we see is that sometimes if you can actually manage some of those factors is better, you might be able to lower the amount of medications you're taking um, and, 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 and just have a better overall um, life. And, and do we have any sense at all how many Canadians are, go undiagnosed? Lots. I mean, yeah. it's the short answer. Certainly many, many, um, possibly even millions uh, in that sort of pre-diabetic range, which are, again, people who we, we feel we can kind of at times intercept and right. just with, with those lifestyle changes and some focused attention sometimes prevent the, the development of the disease. Um, and then also many who are undiagnosed with the actual disease itself. And I'm sure that's true in kids too. Well, and, and I asked the question because, it, you know, it was just yesterday I was reading a study out of the UK that, that looked at the efficacy of, of early screening for type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. but doing it at local pharmacies, yeah. right. right? Which is not something that I had ever really heard of being sure. done here in Canada. The same way, you know, you might test your blood pressure. Is, is there a need for, for a more kind of expansive uh, regime, a more uh, a program? Well, it's not necessarily. Possible? I think in that study, they weren't talking about being a more expensive regime. They were just saying if there are a lot of people who are going undiagnosed and early diagnosis in that study, they said they were able to diagnose people up to three years earlier and get them into interventions, which could just start with lifestyle changes. And why and, is that early intervention important? Well, it's important because if you go three years with diabetes, and without treatment, for example, all those complications can start mounting up earlier. So hence, you know, this is a mechanism to say that, you know, a person might be more likely to go in, some of my patients go into a pharmacy 12 times a year, but they may not see their primary care provider as often. Right. So the idea that a simple screen could sometimes be doing a finger blood prick test, for example, or getting a small sample of blood that can tell us, you know, if you're at risk. Um, and so not to say that we should start doing that tomorrow, but it's the idea about how do we promote more early diagnosis and management uh, when it's appropriate. There's one other thing that I, that I want to raise here. So another study out of England, they tracked hundreds of people who went on low calorie diets to lose substantial amounts of weight. After a year, almost half were able to reverse their type 2 diabetes and after two years, more than a third were still in remission. Now, it, it's, it's not a, a completely new novel concept that that type 2 diabetes can potentially be reversed. But this was a larger study. Uh, they were able to track people over a much longer period. So, so that's notable. Danielle, what's the moral here? Because, I mean, th the notion that type 2 diabetes is potentially reversible, I mean, that, that would challenge this idea that it's, you know, this inevitably progressive disease. I think, you know, it's interesting there's a double-edged moral on this one. You know, on the one hand, it's a very encouraging sign to think that we have that much agency and control and that we can really uh, stop in its tracks or even reverse the course of a disease like this purely by uh, focusing on those incredibly important treatments, which are diet and exercise. At the same time, I, I do think that there's another moral, which is to, that, you know, there are some things this will work for some people, but not for everybody. Right. And we have to be really clear about not blaming people who are sick for their illnesses uh, and considering also all the social and uh, economic reasons why it might not be so easy for everybody to lose 30 pounds. It might not be so easy for someone to eat healthy or go to the gym or whatever. You know, there are lots of factors beyond our control that society is um, 
is controlling. And so this is a social conversation, not just an individual conversation. And I, and I guess in this particular study in England, I mean, the, the, the weight loss was quite severe, right, in terms of the how they reduced their calorie. In yeah, I mean, the average person that was successful in reversing their diabetes, you know, lost about 20 pounds. So this was significant. And those who were most successful in sustaining that loss actually lost about 30 pounds, right? So these are people who we call, like, significantly overweight or obese. But I think that the thing is, you know, they didn't really reverse their diabetes. They didn't reverse their underlying risk factors. They didn't reverse those things that they couldn't change. It's just that their blood sugar levels now consistently were being measured below a level that we would say clinically this is diabetes. But I think as Danielle was saying, it just reminds us that there's a lot of things we can do that can better control and put us back into that, I would call it safe zone. Lennox, I'll give you the final word here because I'm just curious to know the sum total of the picture. I mean, we've known for a long time that type 2 diabetes instances of it are on the rise. Absolutely. That it has been getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. To what extent is it getting worse? Is it leveling off? Is there is there hope? Well, you know, I think our general sense is that uh, it has been increasing dramatically over the past two decades. And when we look at uh, the pediatric population, there is some hope. It looks like it might be leveling off. We don't have the final word on this, but it does look like it might be leveling off. If we look back two decades, maybe three decades, in the pediatric population, this is unheard of. And the rates in the adult population were a lot lower too. So I think it's an interesting commentary on our modern world, the diet, the activities, the exercise, maybe other environmental factors mm -hmm. that we're not even aware of mm -hmm. that result in this increase. And it's something that uh, you know, bears reflection for all of us. Mm -hmm. Lennox, Samir, Danielle, always great to have you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I feel like I need to go and exercise now. Still ahead on The National, how a new generation of Canadian artists is already paying it forward. If it wasn't for those programs in the city or those people that are willing to take time out of their day and act as mentors to me all those years ago, I don't think that I'd be here. But first... Anne McLean uh, near the top of your screen. In case you missed it, the first ever all-women spacewalk was cancelled. Anne McLean and Christina Cook were scheduled to head out on Friday. But after a spacewalk last week, McLean felt her suit was too big. A size L, she needs an M. The space size is very important. Having comfort, being able to move your arms and legs around with ease while you're out there working in space in a pressurized spacesuit is absolutely essential. Some have wondered if this is a case of gender bias. After all, during NASA's Apollo program heyday, space was clearly a man's world. But the issue goes beyond gender. The bulky suit used for spacewalks is extremely complex. Most of it is one size fits all, except for the hard upper torso, known as the hut. The number of astronauts that they can actually walk in space is limited by the number of hard upper torso units. This could have been a man as well who wanted that medium and would have had to bow out. A NASA audit raised concerns there aren't enough space-ready suits left to last until the space station is retired in five-plus years. That's good. Of course, the hope is that all-female spacewalk can happen before then. We have a live update on a developing story out of the greater Toronto area. Police are now confirming the 22-year-old Chinese international student who was abducted on Saturday has been found safe. Wan Jen Lu showed up at a home in Gravenhurst, that's about two hours north of Toronto, seeking help. Provincial police say his injuries appeared minimal, but given the nature of the incident, took him to hospital. We're expecting an update next hour, and we will have the latest on CBC News Network. I don't really hesitate with these kind of things because my focus is really on the people and the people on the ground because I would like to know that if I was in the same situation that other countries and other people would want to come and would help me. A Canadian medical team from the Red Cross is heading to Mozambique where a humanitarian crisis is growing in the wake of Cyclone Ede. The group of 25 is expected to arrive tomorrow. They'll be sent to Bira Central Hospital, where we're told it's likely they'll be performing surgeries in tents and open-air operating rooms. It's estimated about 2 million people in Mozambique have been affected by the storm. UNICEF is deeply saddened and outraged that children are among the victims. 
The United Nations says a staggering one-third of the victims of a recent attack in central Mali are children. It was one of the deadliest raids in an area that has seen a surge in ethnic and jihadist violence. According to the UN, the death toll has risen to more than 150. There are calls for Canada to extend its peacekeeping mission in Mali beyond the scheduled end date in July. Between the Junos last week and the SOCAN Awards right around the corner, Canadian musicians are in the spotlight, being recognized for their incredible achievements. And some are paying it forward by using their platforms to bring up the next generation of aspiring musicians. Tashana Reed explains. Being human in public, Jesse Reyes! Yes! It was a sweet moment for singer Jesse Reyes as she accepted her second Juno Award last weekend. If there's one thing that you're chasing and you're willing to work hard for it, do it, because you could do whatever you want. It's been quite the year for the Canadian Colombian singer. In addition to the accolades, she wrapped a sold out tour and collaborated with some of music's biggest names. One thing high on her to-do list, helping emerging talent. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. On a break from touring, the singer sent out a simple message. I'm going to be hosting a free songwriting workshop for kids in the city. The submissions poured in, 1,300 of them, with participants uploading their work using a hashtag. It really helped when someone's voice resonated to me and I went and it showed that they were fighting for it. It showed that they're, that it's all over their feet and that they're promoting themselves. Reyes handpicked five singers. She then assembled a team, her tour guitarist, engineers and industry producers for a two-day songwriting workshop here at Dreamhouse Studios in Toronto. No hurricane can put out this flame. The singers had the opportunity to write and record their original songs at a professional studio. Being in an environment where I'm forced to believe in myself and see the beauty in myself means everything to me. Reyes knows firsthand the impact of experiences like this. Just four years ago, she was a student at the Remix Project, a city program where she learned to engineer her music and navigate the industry. If it wasn't for Remix, if it wasn't for those programs in the city or those people that are willing to take time out of their day and act as mentors to me, all those years ago, I don't think that I'd be here. Reyes isn't the only Canadian artist finding new ways to nurture new talent. <laughs> Fellow Juno nominee The Weeknd and his creative team launched House in Toronto this fall, an incubator for design creatives and future entrepreneurs. Relationships in a democracy. Juno nominated funk duo Chromio open up their recording studios to help produce young talent. For us, it's important to be able to open our studio doors, invite people in, show them what we know, learn from what they know. Lead singer Dave Maklovich says working with up and coming talent has been rewarding for them. We get tremendous joy and inspiration from that. And it's a, ge it's a generous exchange when the chemistry is right. Back in Toronto, that inspiration is what this next generation of artists will be holding on to. You make me wanna fly. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is next, but first, some well-earned congratulations to all of our colleagues in Canadian journalism at the Canadian Screen Awards tonight, including some people from this program. Rosie, Ian, Andrew, thank you boys for taking care of the show tonight. Hey, it's the least we could do. That, of course, is Adrian accepting one of two Canadian Screen Awards tonight, one for her work on The Royal Wedding, the other for the story Ruins of Raqqa. In total, the National won four awards, including Paul Hunter for Best Reporter. That was on our debut night. And some of our other colleagues did well. Uh, multiple awards, including Best Talk or Entertainment Series, Best Local Reporter, and more. It's a cliche, but it's true. Everything can change in a second. And for siblings in New Brunswick, a frightening experience over the weekend gave them firsthand proof of just how quickly tragedy can strike. But thankfully for this sister and brother, the day was one of relief instead of tragedy. This close call and act of courage is our moment. I was following my dog on the ice and the ice started to break under my feet and the current was bringing me away from shore. The water was to my neck, and I screamed for help. I went there to see what happened, 
and um, yeah, my doll was in the water, like just about her neck. I put my feet in the water. I put my whole my body in the water, and then I took her by uh, her waistline and I pulled her onto the shore. To be honest, I was like scared a little bit for losing my sister. He saved my life. I don't know how I could ever thank him. I'm happy to have him. So, uh, so obviously, Ian, this is a story of, uh, you know, heroism, of luck, too, between a brother and sister. You also saw a dog there. That's Hectus. He was apparently on the ice, and, and she was able to grab onto his leash, which also helped uh, pull her up. Also a story about the importance of swimming. The kids obviously adorable. Uh, their parents saying that they have always felt it's, it's critical for their kids to learn how to swim and uh, not just to, to be able to swim their way out of that, but just to stay calm, I think, under pressure. So as you mentioned, a story with a happy ending and all about courage and excellence. That is The National for March 26th. Good night. Good night.